This lesson continues the study of rotational motion uh, that we started in the last few lessons. And uh, to show you how that continues on and kind of fits into the big picture, uh, I'm going to put the comparison table up between translational motion and rotational motion uh, that I put in some of those earlier lessons where uh, we defined the translational motion variables, uh, position, velocity, and acceleration, and I sort of made an analogy of them with the rotational variables, angular position, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. Uh, we then learned the relationships if you remember back to the very beginning of our study of physics, we learned the relationships between these uh, translational quantities. We called them the kinematic equations. And they were equations such as uh, x equals p0 t plus 1 half a t squared. And we learned in the uh, more recent lessons that you can have similar kinematic equations for rotational motion. Things like theta equals omega 0 t plus 1 half alpha t squared, uh, and so on. So uh, we're going to take the next step in filling out this table of in our study of rotational motion today. What we did earlier in the semester when we studied translational motion was after we learned the kinematic equations, we started talking about force. Uh, in particular, we started asking the question, well, why does something accelerate if it accelerates? Or why does something not accelerate if it doesn't accelerate? And we learned Newton's laws of motion. Uh, in particular, we learned that if the net force on an object is equal to zero, that it wouldn't accelerate. The acceleration would be equal to zero. That's uh, otherwise known as Newton's first law. An object at rest will stay at rest unless an outside force acts on it. An object in motion will stay in motion with the same speed and in the same direction uh, unless an outside force acts on it. Well, there's something similar for rotation. Okay. It turns out that if an object is not rotating, then it will continue to not rotate unless an outside torque is exerted on it. So we can write that as if the net torque on an object is equal to zero, then its angular acceleration will be equal to zero. That means an object that's not rotating will continue to not rotate unless there's a torque on it. An object that is rotating will continue to rotate at the same speed unless there's a net torque on it. So uh, that means, OK, well, that the next thing we need to do is, well, exactly what is this? torque that you're using. I've given it the symbol, a capital Greek tau, but I haven't defined torque. So that's the goal uh, of the rest of this lesson is exactly what is torque exactly. So torque is the rotational analog of force. And it's related to force, but it's not equal to force. Torque is equal to R times F times sine theta, and I'll define each of these terms uh, one at a time. Okay. F is uh, the most obvious one. That stands for the force that is applied to the object. R is uh, the distance. Uh, between the place where you're applying the force, F, and the pivot point. Okay, 
and then finally theta, this angle, is the angle between F and R. The easiest way to understand this equation, of course, is uh, with an example. So let's um, let's use an example of, for example, a door. Let's say you want to open a door. And we're going to be looking at this door down from above. Okay, so here is the top view uh, of a door. Here's the hinge, and here is the door. Okay, now if you want to open this door, then uh, probably just intuitively, you're going to know that the most effective way to open that door would be to push right here in that direction with some force F. Okay, and using the concept of torque, we can understand why it is that that's the best way to push on the door in order to open it. Okay, because by pushing in that way, you're going to get the maximum torque. So what would the torque be uh, in this case? Well, the torque in that case would be R. So R in this example would be this distance right here. F uh, is the force that I've already drawn, like that. Okay, and then theta would be the angle between R and F. In this example, theta is 90 degrees. When you plug in 90 degrees here for theta, sine of 90 is equal to 1. So you get a large uh, value for torque if you push that way. Uh, looking at the torque equation, you can see learn why it is that that spot right there at the end of the door is the best place to push. Uh, because if I pushed somewhere closer to the pivot point, then even if I use the same force, F, I have a smaller R, and I'm not going to get as much torque. Okay, you and you intuitively know this, right? You're just automatically going to push on the end of the door furthest away from the hinge. You would not try to open a door by pushing right up next to the hinge because you understand that it would take a lot more force in order to do that. Now, how about the angle? Well, you sort of have an intuitive understanding of that as well because I'm pretty sure that if you were attempting to open this door, you would push the way I've drawn the force at the end there. Uh, you would not, most likely, attempt to push the door like that uh, at an angle. Because now, this angle here, let's say if that angle is about 30 degrees, then now, instead of having a 90 degree angle, I've got a 30 degree angle. Well, sine of 30 degrees is only equal to a half. So by pushing at an angle, uh, other than 90 degrees, by pushing at a 30 degree angle, I've cut my torque in half, even though I'm using the same force. So in this example of opening the door, you see how all three of the components of torque work together. And you sort of already have an intuitive understanding of this, right? You know if you push harder, you know, got a bigger F, then the door will open uh, better. If you push farther away from the pivot point, you're increasing R. You get a better torque. And then finally, you want to make sure you're pushing perpendicular to the door so that you maximize sine theta. So uh, when we say torque, and we're using, and I'm talking about Newton's laws of motion for rotation, they all involve torque, and that's what we mean up here in this table. 
So we now know, okay, that door, for example, if there's not a net torque on the door, the door is not just going to spontaneously open. We also know that if the door is rotating, then it will continue to rotate at the same speed unless somebody puts a torque on it. Okay, that is Newton's first law of motion for rotation. Well, how about Newton's first, how about Newton's second law of motion? Do you remember that's back from uh, much earlier in the course? The sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law of motion. It tells us what happens if the net force is not equal to zero. It says that if there's a net force on an object, it will accelerate. And it will accelerate by an amount that depends upon the mass. A bigger mass will accelerate less than a smaller one. Newton's second law of motion has a rotational analog. The sum of the torques equals I times alpha. In other words, if there is a net torque on an object, it will have an angular acceleration. How much that angular acceleration will be depends on this quantity i. So we now have another term that we need to define. i is a quantity called the moment of inertia. And I want you to think of it as the rotational analog of mass. It's a lot like mass, but it's not exactly the same thing as mass. Okay. I uh, depends on the mass, but not just on the mass. Uh, it depends on the mass of the object, the size of the object, shape, um, how the mass is distributed, uh, and even where you put the pivot point. Uh, again, let me just give you some examples of uh, objects that have various moments of inertia. Okay. For example, I might have a disk. And uh, it could be a solid disk that I am rotating about the center. Or it could be something that has the same shape, but is just a thin hoop. Now, it's possible, uh, for example, that this disk has a mass m and a radius r. And this hoop also has a mass m and radius r. But these two objects, even though they have the same size, and the same mass, they are not going to have the same moment of inertia because it is harder to rotate the hoop than it is the solid disk. If you look in a table, uh, you can find a table on the internet or in your textbook, if you have a textbook. Uh, you can find moments of inertia for various objects. Okay, and this is not something that you need to memorize. Uh, 
but what you need to know is uh, that various objects have different moments of inertia, and you need to at least know enough to look it up in a table. Okay, so uh, for example, if you were to look on the internet, you know, table of moments of inertia or something like that, then you would see that the moment of inertia of a solid disk uh, is equal to the mass of the disk times the radius of the disk squared. Whereas the moment of inertia of a hoop with the same mass and radius is on, is uh, m r squared. Actually, this one is one half m r squared. The disk is one half m r squared, and the hoop is m r squared. Uh, and since torque equals I times alpha. If I apply the same torque to both of these objects, then this one will have a bigger angular acceleration because it has a smaller moment of inertia. It's just like if you apply the same force to a small mass, it will have more acceleration than a big mass. So now uh, you've learned Newton's first and second laws of motion for rotation. Uh, the law of inertia, which says that if there's no net torque, then the rotation will not change. And if there is a net, net torque, there will be a rotational angular acceleration, and it's inversely proportional to this quantity called moment of inertia, which you can look up uh, on a table for various shapes. <laughs>